Imagine if you were given just five months to live, but then after this devastating news, your doctor told you that if you were careful and all you had to do was expend less energy every day, you could live out a full, long, healthy life. Would you do it? Heck yeah, you would. So would I. But as stewards of planet Earth and taking care of its health prognosis, we are failing, especially in the United States. If everyone in the world lived the way people do in the US, we would need five Earths to provide enough resources for everyone. And it's getting worse. We hear about the urgency of the global crisis, we read about it, we give TED Talks on it, but I wonder, are we really taking the steps necessary to slow down our energy consumption in a significant way, enough to make a difference? We're definitely trying. Solar power is one of them. Solar energy is generating more electricity than ever before, and the price of solar panels has dropped over 70% in the past decade, which is smart because the amount of solar energy that hits the earth in one hour is more than all humans use in one year. There are other kinds of renewable fuels as well, biodiesel, biomass, research in wind and wave and tidal power is expanding. So there is a lot of hope. Still, we rely on fossil fuels more than any other resource. And many experts are saying that oil production is flattening and declining. The crisis is here. It takes an average of 30 years for a new technology to become commercially integrated. And so we are falling behind in this gap to fill the need for our enormous global energy consumption. The two ideas that I'm sharing to approach this urgent situation start with this question. What if we didn't consume as much energy? And I don't mean just remembering to turn off the lights when we leave a room. Look around you right now. For most of us, 90% of everything in the room that we're in was produced by a large manufacturing company. If industrial manufacturers in the US reduced the amount of energy they used by just 5%, that would be enough to power all residential households in the US for two months every year. But why stop at a 5% de decrease? It's possible to do even better than that with something called a catalyst. Why is this important? Because chemists like me believe that catalysts can be one of the solutions to the world's energy crisis. You might be asking yourself, what exactly is a catalyst and how does it work? That's what I'm here for. Let's dive into some chemistry for a moment and imagine a chemical reaction. We have two molecules here and they're going to collide. And when they smash into each other with enough energy, the atoms recombine and form new molecules as products. Normally, chemical transformations are energy intensive processes, but we all see it as worth it. We want those products. We want the plastics, the semiconductors, the fuels, the pharmaceuticals, all those things that collectively we see as crucial to everyday life. These chemical reactions though, they consume a lot of energy. And this is where the catalyst comes in. In chemistry, catalysts are not giving the molecules extra energy to make them react. Instead, catalysts interact with the reactant molecules and provide them with an alternative lower energy pathway for them to go. Imagine if you're hiking from one valley to another and there's a mountain range in between. If you choose the path over the top of the mountain, you spend a lot of energy. A catalyst is like a Sherpa that guides you through the low altitude canyon between the two that connects the two valleys. And bonus, the catalyst is regenerated at the end of the chemical reaction, ready to usher more molecules over to create more products. Increased use of catalysts is the first change we need to be able to make that reduction in global energy consumption. Note that catalysts in themselves, that's not a new idea. Catalysts are used all the time, just like in our catalytic converters. But we need to use them even more and we need to develop more efficient catalysts. Small optimizations can have a ripple effect and make huge impacts when we're talking about large scale products like fuels and fertilizers. So is that just it? Just use a catalyst and we've overcome the crisis. No, not so simple there's one more important issue to consider, what the catalyst is made of. 
Currently, the most effective and widely used catalysts are of extremely rare metals. Platinum, iridium, ruthenium, and others work exceedingly well, and they have earned the name strategic metals. But there's a problem. They're an extremely short supply in the Earth's crust. We need catalysts that don't rely on us mining and using these rare, expensive elements. Instead, they need to come from the category of Earth Abundant. The first suggestion I made was to increase the use of catalysts, and here's the second change, creating those catalysts from Earth Abundant materials. The most Earth Abundant element on Earth that can be used as catalysts is silicon, well known for its use in the semiconductor industry. Iron is also very common in the Earth's crust, as is titanium. Inspired by the natural process of photosynthesis, these three elements have been studied in prototype devices that catalyze the water-splitting reaction. This is using energy from the sun and then taking an abundant molecule, water, and dividing it into clean burning fuel, hydrogen, and a clean, safe byproduct, oxygen. Along with silicon, iron, and titanium, there are many other abundant elements that are being auditioned as catalysts. Compared to those rare strategic metals, they're less toxic, less expensive, and are between 10,000 and 10 million times more abundant in the Earth's crust. That means less environmental impact from mining those rare metals like platinum. Earth abundant catalysts. This isn't a silver bullet and it's definitely not a platinum bullet, but the impact of making just this one change has enormous potential. Imagine a world where buildings are spray painted with materials that absorb light and inexpensive catalysts can use tap water to create clean burning fuel. Imagine this scenario where electricity isn't dictated by the power grid, how well it's behaving or whether your community even has one. And this vision is within reach. There are chemists who have created prototypes using earth abundant elements, such as silicon and others like cobalt and phosphorus. And these brilliant and passionate researchers are just a few steps away from getting those devices to be commercially viable. This would mean electricity that is cheaper, more accessible and cleaner. If you're excited about these ideas like I am, there are action steps that we can take to keep this technology moving forward. And one way is to support research on Earth Abundant Catalysts. Cheerily the work being done by these researchers such as Nate Lewis, Teresa McCormick, Shannon Betcher, and many others. Support young people who are interested in science and technology and will carry on the development of these catalysts. Call or write your local policymakers and remind them that without this kind of research, our Earth is running out of time. Going back to the doctor's prognosis, we need to do what we can to give Earth that long, healthy life. I will leave you with one last idea to ponder, and that is what else can we learn from catalysts? Part of the beauty of catalysts is that their strongest asset is often counterintuitive to us. We spend so much of our lives trying to solve problems by doing more. A catalyst, on the other hand, is all about finding pathways that use the least amount of energy for the desired output. We can all take something from this, can't we? Can you think of an energy crisis in your life that you're looking to solve and you just keep expending more energy? Perhaps instead there's a catalyst or a lower energy pathway that you should be searching for instead. Thank you.